Texas design and reverse engineering play on both sides of the field. Woo! Yes, so enjoy this slide. It's going to be the background for almost everything. And so, yes, um, I am a double E by training. I went to, um, or yeah, I have five years of work experience through various internships and such. Um, my first internship, I actually did control systems at Ohio State University. And that was unpaid, but uh, that's where I really didn't. Uh, that's where I really learned that I didn't like control systems, and robotics is actually kind of boring in that kind of sense. Just a bunch of coordinates, right, and optimization. So um, it wasn't what I wanted to do. And then so I went to Wright State, uh, uh, focused mostly in radar and electronic warfare, which um, that was mostly my uh, internships during school. Uh, like the background is a. Uh, motherboard or expansion board for a interesting system that went in a black box, black not not like the recording black box, but um, like a black box as in it's pretty interesting, and can't talk too much about it. But the cool thing about this board that is in the background is that it was a twenty thousand dollar at the time FPGA uh, Xilinx Ultra Scale, and my job at that time was to interface that between uh, that interface and uh, DDR4 RAM, which at that time in 2015 was brand new. We had to sign an NDA for it. Uh, it was going to have a terabyte of, of DDR4 RAM because for this application, we couldn't use any SSDs or hard drives because they were just weren't fast enough. So uh, we just buffered whatever data through that. And so I had to actually do a lot of the signal integrity testing for that using MetaGraphics hyperlinks signal integrity tools, which is, um, is really awesome. And uh, to be honest, that uh, experience really uh, opened my eyes to how complicated a, uh, really a computer motherboard is, because even a computer motherboard is like 10 or 12 layers. I mean, this one's 40 layers, so it's a little bit more complicated. But um, a lot of the same concepts are very important for like signal integrity, crosstalk analysis, and such. Um, every, all those traces are antennas, so you have to always be careful. So yeah. Um, yep, I'm an amateur radio operator, KDATUO. Um, and in that one picture that I'm actually blocking. Wow, OK. Um, yep, I'm finally using my new radio that has full access to HF shortwave and uh, finally get to use my extra class privileges. And um, yep, my day job is I'm a hardware reverse engineer, um, working at another defense contractor. Can't talk too much about that. And other times I do hobby electronics, uh, PCB design, consulting, and amateur radio, and refurbishing uh, and reselling test equipment. So um, this is kind of the overview. Uh, so one, we're going to go over why hardware reverse engineering is a thing, um, the legality of it. So you're a design engineer. So uh, how do you transition those skills to reverse engineering? Because that's how I kind of uh, got into this. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the book PCBRE, which is a fantastic book. There's literally no other book like it that documents the process. And uh, some tool recommendations, some examples of uh, some basic PCBRE and uh, conclusion, and hopefully we'll get to questions and discussions and references. So, yeah. and yes, please feel free to correct me at any time. I am not an expert by no means. I've only been doing uh, hardware RE for like a year and a half at this point. So, I'm yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, <laughs> Yeah, um, so why hardware are you? So um, uh, most interestingly enough, of course, or as most people, whenever I tell them I'm a hardware reverse engineer, they think that I'm doing it in a commercial setting of like, oh, I want to uh, reverse engineer our competitor's products so that we can make money off of it, right? And uh, Or in some cases, trying to find out if someone infringed on our patent or whatever. And uh, there's also the point of self-preservation and survival, like knowing um, what is out there and also just just yeah protecting your IP making sure that it isn't reused somewhere else without any licensing and uh, archiving of course because we have to somehow read all those floppy disks and old storage mediums somehow there's still a lot of important data on that and uh, of course here at Teardown uh, curiosity and education is a huge point um, circuit breaking and modding is huge and uh, going with uh, Dave Jones's motto don't turn it on take it apart 
And uh, hardware IE is used for varieties and extensions. So like um, all those mobile phone cases, someone had to reverse engineer or kind of find out all the dimensions of like, let's say the iPhone here. And that's why you end up with all these cool iPhone cases and variations. Or uh, third party hardware, so like all the expansion boards for like the Raspberry Pi and the Arduino kind of fall in this category as well because someone had to go in there and reverse engineer the protocol or it's open and they just copy and uh, do their cool things. And uh, the cool points also with hardware IRE is hardware exploitation, which um, I don't know if Joe Grand or Joe Fitzpatrick are here, but uh, that's kind of their area of expertise. And uh, of course, right to repair. So very important point. So I am uh, now back to uh, legal stuff about uh, reverse engineering. So according to Randy Torrance of Chipworks, which I have this whole reference and everything, in the semiconductor industry, reverse engineer can encompass product teardown, so what chips are used for, system analysis, how chips are used, and uh, those are kind of like the main points that we focus on because uh, I don't do any of the uh, process analysis or the circuit analysis of like actually on the die because I don't have any equipment to do that, uh, to do actual chip decapulation or anything, decapsulation. And so, uh, yeah, in the United States Code, there is a actual um, statement in there that says you can actually reverse engineer. And so you can read that. <laughs> And so that's what that, uh, uh, Randy Torrance is referring to. And so, there. So you're a design engineer. How do I trans? So your typical design re engineer responsibilities are, you know, taking requirements from a customer, making a schematic or block diagram to describe that system. Uh, you're doing all sorts of research, calculation, and simulation for choosing parts. You know, you're buying evaluation boards, hooking them all together. Uh, you're creating a bill of materials, you're using EDA tools like Eagle, Metagraphics, you name it, to do your schematics and board layout. Sometimes firmware and software development, not my area of expertise at all. Uh, simulation, d digital design, analog, mixed signal, RF, more of like that uh, hyperlinks software I was talking about with uh, simulating actual like RF signals in a digital context. So. Because, yes, things like DDR4 RAM run all the way up in the RF range of like 3.2 and up above for some crazy uh, overclockers. And so, and of course, prototype, test, debug, and repeat. And as you'll see, a lot of these transition pretty well over to uh, reverse engineering. So just like using, just having that knowledge of using a multimeter and other test equipment that's, you could do a ton of work just doing that when reverse engineering, just having that knowledge. And uh, if you're a design engineer, you can pretty much quickly recognize common circuit topologies. So like uh, different kinds of DC to DC converters and all that, um, and all sorts of other A to D and cool circuits. And uh, you kind of know where at least uh, components are usually placed. Like you're obviously not gonna have a, uh, like a, power supply emitting a bunch of RF and EMI next to your digital circuitry and sharing a ground plane there or anything. And uh, uh, you can identify boundaries on mixed signal boards. So like some boards clearly have marked just by looking at traces or other uh, uh, features that, okay, I know this part's RF, I know this is power, this is digital, and this current where it mixes. Um, so you know how to find interfaces because you know how you need to know where your debug ports are. So that transitions over pretty well. And uh, data buses, uh, reading data sheets is a very important skill because as I'll get into it, um, design engineers can be quite lazy. So they'll use reference designs, of course, because it's a known working design. Uh, you're obviously not going to roll your own design if, unless you have very expensive simulation tools to uh, foresee any like weird RF or EMI concerns and constraints. And uh, using EDA and CAD tools is important because you need to document what you, uh, what you find. And uh, being aware of security is typically a low priority in the design context. I mean, you see that in IoT devices, so um, there's that. And uh, bonus, knowing firmware and software, which I don't, but I know a lot of design engineers that have that knowledge. That's a very useful skill set to have when you're reverse engineering or in the, in the field. So, 
as I said, reference designs and such, being aware of the rules. When designers lay out a board, they stay as close, if not copy the reference design directly, and they take layout considerations on the data sheet very seriously because um, someone, a bunch of, a whole team of engineers from, uh, for example, like Texas Instruments, because they have some of the best uh, data sheets uh, with reference designs. Uh, you have a whole team of engineers that are dedicated to just optimizing the performance for a chip. And then there they already have reduced parasitics on their reference design, as well as easy to debug uh, test points and such. And uh, in, in, the, oh, yeah, in the long run, uh, this saves time and money, of course, because uh, you're spending less time on development. You're just copying over design and putting on your board. And uh, this applies pretty much to almost everything. Uh, almost all the boards I see at work, um, it's kind of interesting because I'll look at, uh, since I need to find out how a board is powered, our customer is very interested in that. Um, looking at just DC to DC converters, it's, very, it's sometimes very scary to see that they copy literally like the reference design, just like, it's like they literally copied the eval board and just plopped it on there and then uh, messed it all together. And so uh, knowing these rules can reduce your uh, time in design or reverse engineering. And uh, who in here has actually tried reverse engineering a board? So, oh yeah, of course, Joe, Joe Grant back there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yep, next slide. So being aware of design rules. So uh, this is an example from, I think a, uh, well, yeah, now microchip, but Atmel uh, AVR on the 32A4 or just their 8-bit uh, microcontrollers. So you'll see even for simple uh, microcontrollers, they'll actually have these specific rules saying that like, oh, here, um, want an actual like fair IP here so that you don't, uh, your voltage doesn't vary a lot or anything. You have a bypass cap there. And then making sure your crystal is there with your actual capacitors as well. And uh, here they have, of course, the decoupling on VCC and ground. And they're, they're even nice enough to give you a whole little reference circuit board design there and layout. And uh, even uh, debug interfaces follow this rule because something like JTAG runs from like 10 to 100 megahertz. So um, you obviously don't want to run that for more than uh, five inches because weird things cap into your signal on the way and uh, your, your process of debugging becomes quite more complicated. You're gonna have to do jumper wires or all sorts of other things. Um, so yeah, this is an app note from uh, Lauterbach, which they make really expensive JTAG tools. And uh, here we have uh, a example of a Texas Instruments data sheet, which has a very, very detailed layout uh, concerns and designs or considerations. So here you'll see that they specify in glorious detail like, hey, you need an inductor there, you need a capacitor there, they have to be kind of this close and all that. And yep, they even give you like layer by layer the reference design. So I think that's actually one of their evaluation boards that they do that. And uh, you can even find there that they'll have their Gerber files on there so you can plop that into your favorite EDA tool and look around. And so referring to the book, um, yeah, I can, I hope everyone buys this book that's really interesting already because uh, there's, there's a really nice chapter in there that Joe Grant wrote, of course, and uh, it's very applicable, uh, applicable for hardware exploitation even though uh, most of the focus is on mostly just uh, like for uh, legacy hardware, just like, oh, I have a board that was used at a power uh, supply, or. Uh, power substation for control. And uh, now that the manufacturer is out of business, I need to somehow reverse engineer, recreate this board. It's like, so it's kind of mostly focused on just recreating old hardware and such. But uh, there's a lot of similar points in here that are uh, valid for uh, hardware exploitation as well. So a good example of uh, what's kind of in the book is there's some nice tables in here that kind of describe like when you should really uh, either attack a board or not, because 
So like, you know, zero is like, I guess we can argue that that's a lot of IoT devices right now. No special security features are used. All parts are really accessible and can be easily investigated. I mean, yeah, like they get the, like some devices, they'll just give you the debug port for free. Like it's even, it's even nicely labeled on silk screen saying JTAG, right? <laughs> And then, um, I mean, I haven't seen anything uh, even in my work that uses cryptographic modules. So uh, I think in my uh, line of work, I've only really faced, the the, diff the most difficult thing I faced is maybe like a level two or three, but at least I have a team behind me. And so that is just more like uh, some actual physical examples. And so, uh, the one chapter I actually really like in this book is going back uh, chapter three, which is manual override, uh, manual override, which hits a lot of the key points in hardware design. It, it almost, uh, the, the author, KT, um, he, he almost really sounds like a design engineer when he's talking about it, even though he, he admits that he isn't, but like he hits all the key points just like with the layout and uh, some trade-offs and compromises made by engineers. Like he, he completely understands why sometimes uh, devices can be insecure because just as Joe Fitz said this morning, like you're faced with all these time constraints. So most of the time you just have to kind of uh, plop together a bunch of reference designs and just get your device going and just ship it out. Um, so that's why security is mostly like the last or at least a concern. So there's that, and yep, in that chapter, there's nice figures like this that tell you why, like, hey, this is why you want to have separate ground planes for your digital and analog sections because you obviously don't want this where you have a capacitive uh, field between your digital and analog circuitry because that can, in, especially in high speed uh, devices, can do all sorts of weird, unpredictable things that you don't want. Oh, yeah, here, take a picture. So tools, so uh, basic, well, this didn't catch that in formatting. Um, the soldering station, so invest in a nice Hacko, Weller, JPC, Metcal, you name it. One of those, those are worthwhile if you get a genuine one. Um, hardware rework station and a microscope is nice to have. Um, most importantly, you have to have a really nice multimeter. I, I mean, I prefer Fluke. It just works and uh, if you drop it, it won't break, they're, they're built like a brick. And uh, investing good bro in good probes is really nice, nice sharp ones especially since you want to break through the oxidation layer on some of your tri uh, on your solder joints. And uh, uh, one of my favorite things I like to do at work is uh, the conductive silver stretchy fabric. So uh, you can get that on like Adafruit or even on Sparkfun. Why well, you actually end up doing? I wish I brought it here. Then, uh, so I'll clip a lead to some of this fabric, and then I'll just kind of like search around the board for any hidden traces. Because um, I run run into a lot of boards that have a lot of hidden vias and blind vias, so um, it's very hard to trace one uh, one trace down a rabbit hole, and then it's like it pops up in a really random spot. So having that conductive fabric can uh, at least narrow down where it is, and then you kind of just look around and it's like, oh, okay, it's right there. So it's a really nice thing to have. And then uh, DigiKey PCB reference ruler, or really any of those PCB reference rulers are, are probably one of the best reverse engineering tools I uh, have in my arsenal, because I use the uh, pitch measurement, like so the actual like, connector measurement or the lead measurements on there all the time, because if I want to source the connector, I just put, plop the ruler on a board and then it's like, okay, so it's one millimeter pitch and I just uh, order a part quickly through Arrow for free overnight shipping. And uh, having a computer with Linux is nice since uh, some things I do at work, I actually all desolder uh, the EMMC BGA packages and then just run all, all the data lines to a micro SD card reader. And uh, having Linux, uh, Linux system and just using DD tools, you can just copy the whole entire file system with no problem, of course. And uh, having your basic set of test equipment, a uh, logic analyzer most of the time is fine. And then a power supply, good oscilloscope. Uh, I really like component testers, so like uh, even something like this $20 uh, cheap TC1 uh, component tester from China is really nice because you can at least do your basic LCR measurements and then um, it'll identify a few types of transistors and BJTs, MOSFETs, that 
And uh, I even have one actually in here. So, whoops. Uh, so I really like this Peak uh, Semiconductor Analyzer because uh, there are certain packages on boards that I run into that look like, uh, so like a six pin IC, which it looks, yeah, it's in a SOIC and then uh, what ends up happening is like, okay, so I see that these traces are connected. It looks like it's like a normal integrated circuit, but when I uh, look up the part number, it doesn't show up as any you know, an integrated circuit. And so I'm like, okay. And I see a bunch of uh, listings for different types of uh, transistor arrays or dual transistors. And so I'll just hook up this to uh, three leads on the IC looking package and it'll identify that, oh, it's a BJT or a MOSFET, you know, two of them in one package. And so that saved me quite a bit of time, especially since uh, it'll tell me whether it's NPN, uh, PNP, um, uh, N-channel or P-channel MOSFET, one of those. And then at least when I'm searching the part on a database, I'll know exactly where to look and then cross-reference that. And so, yep, I, yeah, I thought I deleted this slide, but I didn't. Yep, I talk about that here. And so parts and consumables, uh, small diameter light solder is the best. Just get the thinnest you can. Um, having too much solder on anything is typically a bad idea. You don't want a big blob on your board. And uh, having a nice flux syringe is great. Uh, use as much flux as you want. It not, usually doesn't hurt unless uh, you need to get back in working condition, which it could get really messy. Uh, chip quick is really nice for removing uh, parts, but then of course you have to be careful not to tilt the board because it gets everywhere. And uh, capped on tape is really nice for putting on uh, like little test jigs for on your boards so, or just wires so that they don't short out and it's just good for separating things. 99.9 um, .9 isopropyl alcohol, pretty much standard. Oh, whoops. Uh, Kim, tech, uh, Kim wipes the non-lint kind is great, or like pretty much any anti-lint wipes are great. Uh, microfiber cloths, uh, assortment of passives because you're gonna definitely lose all those uh, surface mount parts. They'll they'll go into the carpet abyss, never to be found ever again. And uh, all sorts of adapters and probes, pogo pins, headers. Those are generally good things you want to have in stock. Um, and uh, one of my favorite things is the uh, spark fun snappable proto board which you can snap into almost any shape and size and uh, I made a couple of like cool uh, test jigs where or not really test jigs but custom boards where I'll have like a uh, like a quad leaded package on a breakout board and I'll just use the snappable proto board to per like putting a like a crystal and stuff to separate everything so that because there's a couple of boards I've run into where the debug interface isn't broken out so I have to end up manually starting it to like a uh, breakout board and then actually manually putting the resistors to pull it down or pull it up for its programming mode and uh, also having a bunch of the SMD and SMT uh, pro boards is really nice because um, as I was mentioning earlier with this component analyzer uh, I identify a lot of the little tiny transistors, the three liter packages, the SOT 23s and such with this, because a lot of those part numbers can be quite cryptic or very hard to read, or um, in some cases, they just describe uh, all sorts of weird ICs or other semiconductors that don't make sense. So this usually helps me narrow it down. And uh, of course, have to mention safety because yeah, eye protection, first aid kit, fire extinguisher. Uh, try, to, try not to eat at your workstation, especially when dealing with lead solder. Um, <laughs> yeah, yes, we know lead is sweet, but that led to the demise of the Roman Empire. Um, <laughs> they weren't mad, man. Okay. Uh, so yeah, ESD precautions is not absolutely necessary, but it's just nice peace of mind thing to do. And then uh, it's nice to have one or two of the same devices that you're testing because, yep, you're going to probably break that device you're trying to take apart and, you know, probing everywhere. You're going to short something out. The magic smoke is going to inevitably pop out. And so, yep, let's put some skills and concepts to the test here. I have a couple of examples of some unpopulated PCBs from my local surplus electronics store. and. Uh, the two examples are from a, uh, apparently 
the guy that runs the store uh, frequents auctions around the area. And so I, I live in, uh, in Dayton, Ohio, at, around Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, home to uh, Air Force Research Lab. So all these defense contractors sometimes throw out a lot of cool looking circuit boards with very interesting features. Um, and then I also just happen to have a uh, similar radar detector that I use in my car for, um, to you know, not get speeding tickets. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, here. So here, this is kind of easy because you can pretty much clearly see where the RF section is on this board. It's divided by this like moat of insulation, and here you have another section. And uh, here. Uh, Obviously, some like FPGA device here or a processor went there, and uh, here you kind of start to see that maybe there was like an analog to digital converter right here. Uh, you start to see some more mixed signal type uh, design there, and you see this 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 progressive strip line going down to a probably I think it was SMA connector of some kind. And uh, I actually got a board. Uh, along with this that was fully populated but had the FPGA drilled through, so that was fun. <laughs> but it was kind of cool to see the, uh, what components were used. And so, yeah, okay. And so this one's easy for identifying power because here you see um, clearly marked 1.8 volts um, and then 2.5 volts for FPGA, 1.2 volts for an FPGA, 3.3 volt rail for an FPGA, like it's all nicely labeled there. And so here's a uh, picture of my radar detector I took apart. And uh, as I was saying, some boards will give you JTAG for free. There it is right there. Uh, TMS, uh, t or yeah, test clock, test data out, test data in, test reset, all there. And uh, I think what was on this board was a uh, STM32 chip. So. Um, I have yet to play around with that. It's sitting on a shelf. And uh, so there are many reasons why we hardware reverse engineer from curiosity to business. And uh, please get this book. It's awesome. Can't understate that anymore. Um, if you can design, you can reverse engineer and vice versa. It's pretty easy to go from uh, one to both or back and forth. And uh, the law allows for hardware reverse engineering and invest in a good multimeter. So any questions? Wow, this room got packed. <laughs> yes, Drew. Oh. OK, so um, I've actually at work had uh, boards x-rayed uh, since we have a few partners that have that kind of equipment. So yeah, like. Uh, uh, before I learned that I could use just you know conductive fabric to you know kind of just look around, uh, I had to rely on uh, X-rays of boards to find the blind vias and kind of trace where they went. But uh, as time went on, and I finally got to that uh, using to that method, that kind of went away. So, but uh, I could definitely foresee it being a thing because there are some situations where I'm not allowed to take apart a board. So that's where X-rays are absolutely necessary. Yes. Um, yeah, so there's two different types of x rays. Oh, the, the composite one, which now is easy to get access to through contract manufacturers, right? To yeah. Easy, sort of to trace things out. Um, when I was doing some of the experiments with delayering, I found a, a failure analysis company that had a 3D x ray, so like doing CAT scan. Yeah. So you can actually see layer images. Um, and I think it was like $300 an hour or something. And like, I think the resolution can vary and the sample size is small, but like, so sometimes you can do it. Yeah, I think what you just said was also in the book as well. Yeah, in the in the PCBRE book. So another reason to get it because you know Joe Grant has his all, all his fantastic research in there. Yes. <laughs> yes. And so yeah, references, links. So any more? Any further questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah. What's like the most layers you've ever like, seen on the board? Okay, so the most layers I've ever seen on the board was when I did uh, design and engineering full time as an intern, was that 40 layer board. That's the, that's what the background is from, is that's a 40 layer board that I worked on with that $20,000 FPGA and such. 
Um, yeah, it's like that thick. It wasn't that bad. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's oh like I've seen pictures of uh from manufacturers where I think they do like 88 layers in some cases. Yeah, like I, I like you could probably look it up like 88 la 88 layer board cross section and uh anything it'll pop on on Google. Yeah, it's it's some really impressive stuff. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> or actually, I kind of do. So what they'll actually end up doing is they'll have all these boards with the different insulation material, put them in a vacuum, and then you know they uh, epoxy them all together. At least that's how it was explained to me by one of the uh, field applications engineers when I worked at this company that worked on that board. Yeah, so uh, the, the, there's obviously there's one where uh, intelligence, so like reverse engineering and adversary system, like uh, foreign material intelligence. Uh, I don't work in that area, but I do know that where I live in the Air Force Research, near the Re Air Force Research Lab, there is, uh, they do a lot of that work. I'm, I think it's pretty, it's. To understand, like, technological Correct, so like, uh, what they're mostly interested in most of the time is just like, oh, we, the, um, you know, the Reds, the Red team, you know, the adversary has a radar that we really want to know about because it controls and lock in is the uh, homing system for a very scary missile system that might shoot down our planes, might detect stealth, might not, who knows? They they tend to uh, overblow some of their statements, but um, yeah, they they work on that. Um, somehow they. Yeah, I, I'm still not sure, but sometimes they get this hardware through weird ways. Um, like even at Wright Pat, uh they have uh, like foreign fighters outside, just like in in the place that I described. Because I actually interviewed there, so they had like a, uh, a Russian fighter jet outside the building, and then inside the cafeteria they had all these missiles from Russia taken apart and stuff. So it was really cool to see that. Yep. So, any further questions? Oh, thank you, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <Woo>. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, so.